right. We are back for another round of observing. We will start uh, with introductions in just a moment. Wait a little bit. See if more people jump on soon. Thank you, thank you everybody for joining us this late at night. need to get somebody to write some nice intro music that we can just have playing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get a nice little theme song. Apparently you have to you have to create a YouTube channel before you're allowed to comment on a YouTube video. Oh. Yeah. Or to like chat in it. Right. That makes sense. Right. I think we are going to just go ahead and jump right in to start. So welcome everybody to the live observing session. Uh, I'm going to start with introductions. Hopefully all of you were able to catch the planetarium show earlier this evening. Uh, if not, my name is Adam McCulloch. I am this planetarium specialist here at Glass Education. Uh, with me, as always, is my amazing co-host Katya Gosman who is our professional astronomer for every episode of The Glassroom. She is currently an undergraduate at UChicago, and this fall will be a graduate student at the University of Michigan. And with us, we have our special guest, Amanda Poggle, who is a grad student studying galaxy clusters and gravitational lensing. So she will be our additional expert for the evening as we explore all sorts of different galaxies uh, that you can find even with uh, relatively small telescope. But we have the luxury of having a 20 inch telescope that Katya is going to talk about in just a second. She's going to tell you guys about the Stone Edge Observatory that we are currently using remotely through Slack. So Katya, please tell us a little bit about SEO. Yeah, so Stone Edge Observatory is a really cool observatory in California. It is uh, located in Sonoma. It is actually in a vineyard. Uh, Sonoma is known as being wine country of California. And um, it's privately owned by someone who really loves doing education outreach and supporting us and astronomy education and science in general. Uh, and it's so really cool that we have time to use it. Um, and so it has a 20 inch uh, reflector, Richie Christian design. Uh, telescope and the cool thing is that it has a CCD camera equipped and so we are able to take images of all of the objects that Adam is talking about in a whole bunch of different filters that it has um, and so the telescope has six different filters six that uh, you'll end up seeing <laughs> throughout the night um, there are three wideband filters. Uh, we call them the G, R, and I filters, standing for green, red, and infrared, or like near infrared. Um, and so those filters, as they are called wideband filters, they let in like a range of uh, light. 
so centered at the green, red, and the infrared. Um, and then there's also three narrow band filters, the uh, H-alpha, sulfur-2, and oxygen-3 filters, which, like the name suggests, they let in um, light, so like light that lets us see the elements of H-alpha, so hydrogen-alpha, um, sulfur, and oxygen. And those can tell us things about, for example, star forming regions uh, that we can see in H-alpha regions. So those are really good to image like nebulas, for example. Yes, so uh, we are now gonna walk through kind of the initial steps of taking the observatory and pointing it towards our first mm -hmm. object. And today we're gonna start with a spiral galaxy uh, that is called M101 or the Pinwheel Galaxy. So Kanti, would you like to mm -hmm. uh, get us going there? And then I know you love talking about yeah. uh, the Messier catalog, so I'll let you tell that story <laughs> as well. Uh, yes, okay. So right now uh, on your screens, you can see we are on Slack. And we are actually using this because the telescope is actually controlled through Slack using a command line type interface uh, that was designed by some programmers, engineers who work on Stone Edge uh, called Itzamna. And so what it is, is there is a whole bunch of different commands that you can type in. Uh, if you scroll a little up, you can type in backslash help and it tells you what commands you can issue. And you use this for opening the dome, pointing at things and taking images. Um, and so right now I can show you if the telescope was successfully opened uh, as per the last message. And so we are ready to go to find our first object, which as Adam said is M101. So the first thing we do is we find the object. So I type in find and then M101. And it will search its database. Um, yep, searching the cosmos. All right. Sometimes it takes a little while. Aha, so it has found an object. Wonderful, this is the one we want. And so the next thing that we usually do is we plot. So we type in backslash plot. And what this does is it gives us a nice graph of when the object is observable. So it gives us a graph of its altitude versus time. So on the x-axis, we have time in hours where the origin is set at right now, moving forward into the future. And then on the y-axis, we have the altitude of the object in degrees. So high, how high above the horizon is it? Um, for Stone Edge, we have a limit where we can't look at anything below 30 degrees for the safety of the telescope and other reasons. And actually for most objects, we want to see them when they are at their highest point in the sky, because at the highest point, uh, we are looking through a lot less atmosphere than if we were looking straight down towards the horizon. And that way we have better seeing and the object isn't, doesn't have as much atmospheric disturbance. Uh, so we can see with M101, we're nearing the peak, which is great. It's really high up, uh, so we're good to go. Actually, do you and... want to see where the sun is at the moment? Yes, that's a good idea. Um, so if we want to see the altitude of the sun, we just type in backslash sun. Negative 14.7. That should be... Pretty okay. Amanda, would you like to uh, talk about why we care about what degree the sun is at? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, especially because right now it's negative. So you'd think, you know, it's below the horizon. What's the problem? Yeah, so you can imagine when the sun sets, you still see the sky is pretty illuminated. Uh, so sunset and twilight is defined differently. Uh, based on which definition you're going with. So civil twilight is when the sun is at negative 12 degrees. 
nautical time light is when the sun reaches negative 15 degrees and astronomical twilight is when the sun reaches negative 18 degrees. So we usually try to wait until negative uh, 18 degrees to start observing, but in this case, I think we can probably start when it's negative 15, so mm -hmm. um, uh, nautical yeah. twilight. Uh, and we do this just so that it's easier to see objects that are, you know, really faint and really far. Uh, because if, you know, if you can still see the sun, like, light in the sky, then it'll be harder for you to observe your images, observe your objects. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we're, yeah, all... Sorry. When the sun is below no, the horizon, and your the sun's ray still can re, you know reflect mm -hmm. refract into our atmosphere and so we're able to still see the sunlight despite it being below the horizon yeah so i'm gonna wait a little bit um also because at least to move the telescope because when the telescope moves it actually takes a picture in the process to determine and pinpoint it to its exact location um so i'll wait a few and in the meantime, uh, I can tell you, as Adam mentioned, about Messier uh, and why this mysterious object is called M101. So the M stands for Messier. Uh, Messier is the last name of a Frenchman named Charles Messier, who lived in the 1700s, so the 18th century. Uh, and he was a French comet hunter. Uh, and so back then, when telescopes were not, you know, 200 inch huge mirrors and arid deserts, uh, a lot of things in the sky kind of looked like little fuzzy blobs. And so sometimes you would get a comet, you would think something is a comet, but it's really not. It's a galaxy, it's a cluster, whatever. And so Messier decided to make a list of all the objects that you should avoid when looking for comets. And ironically, as it happens to be, now that list is pretty famous and it contains some of the best uh, objects to lo look at for amateur astronomy, for pretty much anything. It's some of the first objects you might ever see if you're looking through uh, for deep sky objects because they're relatively easy to find and pretty well known. And so this list includes um, things like galaxies, different types of clusters like open and globular clusters, uh, different times of nebulae, there's a super, supernova remnant in there, and a whole bunch of other miscellaneous kind of objects uh, in there. There's currently the list has 110, so it's technically 109 objects because uh, one of them is a duplicate pair. And so M101 happens to be the 101 object that they recorded. It's kind of ironic that the catalog was intended for people not to look there. And then this is the most looked at catalog, astronomical yeah. catalog of all time, probably. It's yeah. one of my favorite stories because of that reason. Yeah. There's actually. Um, so a thing people actually do with this catalog is called a Messier Marathon, which uh, the three of us and some students actually held in March, the last week of March slash beginning of April. Um, traditionally, this event is held somewhere outside, somewhere where it's flat, so you can see the horizon and the entire sky around you. Um, and you're out there with the telescope, traditionally a manual telescope, so not a go-to. And you try and find every single Messier object in one night. Um, and so you, you have to start really early, uh, so right near dawn, right near dusk, and you end all the way at dawn. So it's you know, an all-nighter thing. Uh, it's usually a lot of fun. And so we tried to do a Messier marathon with Stone Edge, uh, trying to take color images. So we wanted to go to as many objects as possible and take images in three different bands so we could create a color image. So mapping each of those three filters to red, green, and blue. Um, due to restrictions of Stone Edge, such as the altitude limit uh, and also the season, though we, we picked a time when in uh, middle March, 
middle to late March, you can usually see all 110 objects in the sky at the same time. So because of various reasons, uh, we couldn't get all of them, but we got a whole lot of objects probably. I mean, we definitely got half, if not more than half of them uh, during the night. And so hopefully we can repeat that process again a few months later and get all the objects that we missed. And the, net, the sun is now at a good altitude, which means I can start pinpointing. So I am going to type in backslash pinpoint. And so right now, uh, Itzamna is moving the telescope to the location of M101. Uh, pinpoint, the command that I issued, we use for almost every object except for really bright objects. Uh, and that the reason being is because what pinpoint does is it will move the telescope to the area where it thinks the object is. And then it will actually take a 10 second exposure of that area of the sky. And then it will send it to a, a service called astrometry.net, which lets you upload a picture of the sky. And it can be any picture. It could be a, a picture you took with your phone. Um, and it will identify the region of the sky that it's in and give you the coordinates of like the center of the image. And so then the telescope uses that in order to better align and center your object. So it's uh, in the center of the field of view. And so we don't do that for bright objects because a 10 second exposure for really bright objects uh, is not very good. It'll leave like an imprint on the camera. So the next couple of images that come out will have like a ghost of that object in it. Building on Katya's point, astrometry.net is pretty great. So if you, you know, want to take a picture of the sky with your like phone camera or whatever, whatever kind of camera in your backyard, you can upload it to astrometry.net and it will tell you exactly where you're pointing and which star is which star. I actually had uh, one of my friends, I gave them a poster of a galaxy, but I didn't know which galaxy it was. So they took a picture of the poster and then I uploaded it into astrometry.net and it told me exactly what galaxy I was looking at. So it's really powerful and pretty cool that anyone can use it. And if you guys have any questions at all at any point uh, tonight, just throw them in the chat box and we'll try to answer them. A lot of astronomy is also about waiting, waiting for yes. the telescope to move, waiting to take the picture. Yes. A the... lot of astronomy is having patience. Waiting for your object to be up. Yeah. Waiting for the yeah. sun to go down. Waiting for you to get your telescope time. <laughs> yeah. Waiting for your grant proposals. OK, yay. It has successfully pinpointed. Hooray. And so now the exciting part is to actually take an image. Um, and so usually what we do, um, at least in general, if we're trying to get like a series of uh, filtered images to get a color image, we usually start out by taking a 10 second exposure just to make sure that the object is in the field of view, everything is okay with the camera, there's nothing wrong with the tracking. Um, and so to do that, we say image 10 for 10 seconds, two, which is uh, the binning, uh, which we'll get into, and then the filter. So in this case, I'm gonna take it without like any sort of color filter, but it just in the clear filter. So it'll just let in light. Amanda, do you want to explain what binning is for Adam? I will leave that to the expert. Uh, sure, I can do that. So your CCD is made up of pixels. Uh, and in our case, the CCD is made up of pixels 
2048 pixels along the x axis and 2048 pixels along the y axis. So the total number of pixels are 2048 squared. Um, if you want, so if you want to bin, if you do a binning of two, you average what the, you average the signal that's in each pixel into two. So instead of now 2048 by 2048, you have an image that has dimensions of 1024 by 1024. And the reason you, you want to do this is when you average over four pixels, so now four pixels becomes one pixel. When you do that, uh, you average over the noise and you increase your signal. Um, and so we do that for not for, for faint objects where we want to make sure that the noise is uh, is smeared over and you could really see the galaxy properly. So you can think of it as like a rain bucket. So if each pixel was a, a bucket in a binning of two, you have four buckets contributing to one big pixel. Huh. What's going on? Um, could be that it's just cloudy in that direction. You can try taking another image. I can take a longer exposure. Yeah, try that. Maybe some of it will pick up then. Um, I can do 60 seconds. Which filter worked best? Uh, M one hundred one has a lot Band. of star formation, star forming regions. So oh, you know, like an H alpha. H alpha would be kind of a cool, cool image. Yeah, let's do one hundred and twenty and H alpha. Would uh. Yeah, so right now, um, it doesn't look like we're getting much light in the clear filter. So I'm going to try taking uh, an image in H alpha, and I'm doing it for 120 seconds uh, to get a lot of light, you know, collect all my light in my light bucket. Um, and so as Adam was saying, this, re this has a lot of uh, star formation in it, which you can see very clearly in H alpha. Yeah, and it could be that, um, you know, even though it's clear out, it could be that it, in that particular direction, there is a cloud that's passing by. And sometimes this happens and we get bad image frames. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I know one other thing that we might be having an issue with is I think the transparency and the seeing are really rough tonight. Yeah. Uh, so Adam saying that the seeing that is referring to how turbulent your atmosphere is basically. So if you have really good seeing, you'll see all your stars as like little pinpricks. Um, if you have really bad seeing, it kind of looks like they're swimming as if you're looking at it at something like in the bottom of a pool, for example. So, yeah, stars, so twinkle, the... stars twinkle Go ahead. because of seeing, because of the atmosphere. They don't actually, mm -hmm. like, they're, they're not intrinsically getting brighter and less bright on such a, in such a fast cadence, but they twinkle because you have atmosphere uh, going in front of them and kind of causing the distortion to the light from our perspective. Yeah. There are stars that do change their brightnesses. They're called variable stars, but they're not that like intense, and they can't. Usually, you can't detect them like with the naked eye that they're changing. Uh, very that they're, that they're being variable. They're changing brightness. It takes like looking with them at uh, with a telescope and getting like a curve. So measuring the light output and like plotting that on a curve to see like a dip in brightness.
looks like we might just have hmm. clouds in our way. Yeah. We could try pointing to okay. the next object. Let's try 51. Oh, uh, that's kind of a similar area. Oh. I was like, I know what 51 is supposed to look like. <laughs> Will be very obvious. You know, fifty one's also pretty bright. So what were you gonna say, Amanda? Mm -hmm. Oh, nothing. Else. You try the cigar or M eighty two. That's also in. Yes. How about M one oh eight, surfboard galaxy. Okay. Uh, surfboard Galaxy. All right, M108. Let me go to sec. So let us find M108. Oh, it's also an Ursa Major. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is an Ursa Major. <laughs> Sometimes you have to put an oh. SK108. Uh, let's try uh, M87. Oh, okay. Not going to be quite as uh, stunning with the spiral arms, but there's still something really cool to talk about with it. It's at its Wonderful. Yay! Perfect. And we are pinpointing. So is M87, uh, what kind of galaxy is it? So M87 is an elliptical galaxy. And so as far as like features you can really see, there is kind of one cool stream. I don't know if we'll actually be able to pick it up. Uh, but M87 is best known for about a year ago this time, where they were first able to take the first ever image of the accretion disk of a black hole. So this was the galaxy that has very, very active uh, black hole in the center. They were able to know it was there and using just tons and tons of data and using multiple telescopes over multiple years imaging this area, were able to actually put together an image of this black hole. And actually, I'll just go grab an, uh, a picture of the what they were able to send out. Yeah, actually, they use the Earth as the telescope as an effective telescope. Mm -hmm. So they had telescopes in different parts of the world. Yeah, and so that like each telescope was like a pixel. And so every time the Earth, like since the Earth rotates, you have like, you have an image and then the telescope would take another image and another image and another image. And so you had kind of like a printer that prints out your, like your, your picture uh, line by line the telescopes were taking pictures of this black hole. Because to be able to get a picture of such a small object, you need a really large aperture. And the largest aperture we could get mm -hmm. was the Earth. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. In terms of telescopes, um, the bigger the telescope is in terms of like the diameter of its lens, the better. Uh, because telescopes are just inherently light buckets. The bigger the bucket, the more light you get, the better image you get. And also Adam, I see, has posted an image of the black hole in Slack. Oh, it's already pointed also, so I should take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope this part of the sky is a little... We're actually getting this right at its highest peak. 
Need a little drum roll sound effect. Do you even hear that? Nope. I tried. There it is. There. <laughs> it kind of worked. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you can see that stars don't have all of this white fuzzy around them. Because uh, this is actually the center of the galaxy. And as I mentioned, so this is an elliptical galaxy, meaning it doesn't have kind of those famous spiral arms that most people think of when they think of galaxies. But a lot of the galaxies in our universe are actually elliptical galaxies. And correct me if I'm wrong, Amanda, but typically elliptical galaxies tend to be older ones. Yep, that's right. Elliptical <laughs> galaxies are usually uh, have red stars, which means that they're older and running out of fuel. Um, and so there's no star formation because they're very gas poor. So there's, because there's not that much gas around these elliptical galaxies, star formation is really tricky unless they start merging with some other galaxy and then they can form stars again. Mm -hmm. That's called a starburst galaxy because there's a burst of star formation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. Ellipticals are dead galaxies, basically, typically. Right. And so M87, uh, mostly best, just best known for uh, the activity going on. And you can look online and find other images of M87 where you can actually see some of the emissions from the black hole. Uh, there's a really cool one where you can see the streak kind of going across the center. Yeah, that was probably taken in a, like a totally mm -hmm. different filter. Oh yeah. Yeah, because black yeah. hole emission is super energetic. So it has to be taken with a totally with a non-optical telescope, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is some of the material being ejected out of this galaxy. And makes it pretty easy to determine uh, this galaxy had a, a very large black hole in it. And it's always nice to know that the black hole is there before you start spending a lot of time imaging. <laughs> Although we are pretty sure that most galaxies uh, if not all, have a supermassive black hole at the center. Yeah, our galaxy does too. Yes, and it has one yeah. of my favorite names. Sagittarius. That, isn't it Sagittarius A star? But it's like A, then asterisk, yeah. yeah. Sagittarius A star. Yeah. All right, All right, so what is up next? So we have a couple options. We can go for uh, another elliptical, the one that Jeff Setzer recommended to us in the earlier show. Uh, there's also an irregular galaxy, C21, mm -hmm. or we can head back mm -hmm. to the other part of the sky and see if Whirlpool is more visible. Mm -hmm. Let us, let's do the Adron elliptical. Make and Jeff happy. Was that what the NGC NGC four five six five? Yes. All right, let's do it. Ah, I just found it. Right now on to edge on elliptical. Uh, so Amanda, actually this might be a good question for you. Elliptical galaxies, are they kind of flat, similar to spiral galaxies, or are they more kind of like globulars? They're like, they're triaxial. Usually they have triaxial symmetry, oh. I think. Uh, or I could be, I could be wrong. I think they're usually just like a, elliptical <laughs> like they're ellipses they're not flat mm -hmm. uh they're more like they're more sphere 
perfectly symmetric. So like okay. spheroidal? Yeah, exactly. Like oblate spheroid? <laughs> That's a good term, yes. <laughs> Yeah, by by a blade spheroid, we just mean like take a sphere and squish it, <laughs> like squish it down, not into a pancake, but into like ovalish. So like kind of like a football, but rounded. Like Fun fact: technically, the Earth is in a blade spheroid. We just don't really notice. It's not as exaggerated for the Earth. <laughs> Mm -hmm. all right it's um but but it so it is true that some massive elliptical galaxies look triaxial uh which means they have like symmetry along three axes oh, that's really cool yeah but it, i think a lot of this is still like being discussed um mm -hmm. yeah trying to understand both uh like so clusters and the galaxies that make up those clusters right and trying to take something that looks two-dimensional from observations and figuring out how it looks three-dimensionally is mm -hmm. not easy yeah That's yeah it's the same way actually with um uh, planetary nebulae so people have been studying different morphologies of planetary nebulae, so their shapes. So there's like a couple of distinct like categories that some scientists break them up into. But there have also been papers that have shown if you take a nebula and it has one shape and then you rotate it like a certain direction, it'll have a different shape, um, which makes the whole study of like the morphology of the nebula kind of null in that sense is that it depends on what side you look at from it you look at it from yeah yeah and yeah so some of the most massive elliptical galaxies appear to be triaxial they also host some of the biggest supermassive black holes which is cool Is there a correlate any correlation between like the mass of the black hole and the shape of a galaxy or other galactic properties that you know of? I'm not sure. I would assume it has to your the mass of your black hole probably correlates to how dense your galaxy is. Because mm -hmm. that means that it's accreting mass faster makes sense it's eating up all of the stuff and the more stuff you have the black hole has to eat up the bigger it becomes mm -hmm. yeah so with uh, so with size and density i'm assuming to first order i don't study black holes so i don't know like beyond yeah, that yeah i okay. figured for anybody that missed the planetarium show uh one of the things that we titled it was kind of the power of gravity and there's really no better example of the power of gravity than a supermassive black hole. It's where the gravity <laughs> is literally so strong that even light can't escape it. It's just pulled back down in. Uh, so what we were talking about was how uh, large galaxy clusters have enough mass and gravity where they can bend the light and create multiple images of galaxies around it, giving uh, what was called gravitational lensing. And so both examples of just how powerful gravity can be when you look at, when you use it on such a large scale. Yeah, a good, uh, an example I like giving is imagine a trampoline. And if you roll like a, a quarter down the trampoline, it'll go in a straight line. But now imagine you put a ball, like a bowling ball in the center of the trampoline and you roll that same quarter, it will no longer go in a straight line. It'll probably go, it'll go around the bowling ball. Um, and if it's not going fast enough, it'll just go straight inside. And so that's what happens to light in um, a black hole. There's something wrong with the tracking on the telescope. <laughs> that is also not an error that I've ever seen. Uh, it just looks like pinpoint failed. You can try taking an image. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody uh, gets a chance to come to one of our star parties, we do a great demo using 
a, what we call a gravity well where we put a weight mm -hmm. in the center of a large spandex ring and we kind of roll different sized uh, balls around that to kind of simulate uh, how things orbit let's see it did not point oh uh, we are not quite there yeah it looks like maybe the seeing conditions are just bad even though it's not very cloudy supposedly yeah and the seeing conditions were expected to be pretty bad so the telescope didn't go through its pointing procedure today i don't know if that makes a big difference i think it's more of it's just having trouble taking that short exposure and then sending it to mm -hmm. uh, what's the site again uh, astrometry.net thank you yeah so what's the command for just pointing not pin just point just point yeah you i can do point yeah try that and then we'll take another yeah one. that might help us yeah also speaking of um the power of gravity and lensing and black holes and all that um as we saw today in early show um, we saw galaxies being lensed and like curved arced like this um, other things actually that can be lensed are things called quasars and so these are like a galaxy with a black hole in the center that is very active and so um, they're like act they're called active galactic nuclei and sometimes they'll have like jets coming out of it so they'll be very luminous like cores of the black holes uh, and so quasars are also things that can be lensed um, and that's a hot topic also right now in terms of looking for them um, some of the rarest things are actually wide separation lensed quasars so they're quasars that are lensed but the separation between the uh, images are wide like they're wider than a certain number of arc minutes in the sky and I think to date, there's only been, uh, there's been a handful of them only found, like five or six at most. And so uh, people are trying to search for uh, more right now. Oh, One more time for the image. The pointing. It looks like we're really going to get killed by the seeing tonight. Yeah. Well, we can try one more. Or... Try. Yeah, I would say like try something that we know. We know what it looks like, where it is, etc. Uh, well, M51 would have been my choice. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah? That's where we're at, right? Um. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, Actually, well, do you know the exact coordinates of the object? I can find them. Can we get those? I want to see where the telescope is pointing in comparison to what the coordinates are. Uh, the coordinates are above. Are they? Yeah. Um, we're new. Oh, I see. Got it. So... It's pointing. It's not this down to the second. No, it's that's... not like, but it says it's pointing to a sky position where the galaxy is. Huh. What a great image, though. That that is a great image. Yes, that's what we were hoping to get. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, hmm. um, I'm assuming the seeing might prevent us from actually looking at galaxies, unfortunately, mm -hmm. tonight. Um, Katya, do you want to try maybe M51, since that's one of the brighter ones? Yeah. Yeah, I um, can take a go at that. And I'm going to upload images from our first observing run that we did, uh, so we can just talk about uh, those galaxies while we're waiting. So we're going to start with uh, one that we were going to image first. 
That was the first one that we did. So on a night where the seeing is a little bit better, you can actually pick out the spiral arms of this galaxy. And this is Messier 101. It's about 70% larger and has uh, almost a trillion stars in here. And as we mentioned earlier, is very, very active with new star formation. So a lot of the uh, spiral arms that you can see have kind of like really thick clouds in them where you can tell that there's a lot of new star formation going on. M101 is also interesting because it's one of the few spiral galaxies, or it's interesting in that it's one of the spiral galaxies where the uh, it's not actually symmetric. The center of the galaxy is slightly off to the side. And as you can see, the arms kind of go farther off on this side than they do on the other one. I wonder why that's the case. Do you think it went through like a mini flyby of another galaxy that disrupted the matter or? Uh, from what I was reading, it is tidal forces from nearby galaxies. Mm. So yes. <laughs> yeah, so like the moon and our tide, mm -hmm. the same thing is happening. Kind of cool. Is it in a? a cluster of galaxies or is it just it happened other galaxies that happen to be in the general vicinity that I, i'm not sure good question all right we pinpointed apparently oh, successfully pinpointed there we go oh that makes me optimistic for an image <laughs> Let's see what we get. Oh, yeah, the seeing is just. I way see too bad. what's going on. Yeah, this is so. It's 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 definitely pointing correctly. It's the con the conditions outside are just not conducive to taking good images. I would have to take a much longer exposure. I could take a longer exposure of this. Yeah, and I think actually it'd be useful, we can talk about, so you can actually see the two cores yeah. of the two main galaxies in this image. So this is the core of the larger galaxy, the Whirlpool galaxy, and this is another one that um, is actually being drawn in by the gravity of the larger one. So these are two merging galaxies, and that is sometimes uh, referred to as galactic cannibalism, which is one of my favorite terms. <laughs> along with spaghettification. Yes, spaghettification, <laughs> definitely up there. So this was an image um, that Katya used uh, SEO to oh. take. So this yeah. is uh, images taken with different filters, stacked and then combined and assigned different colors in order to give a colored image. Amanda, would you like to tell us a little bit about what that process involves? Sure. Uh, so, like Katya said in her introduction of Stone Edge, uh, the telescope has a couple of different wide band filters and a couple of different narrow band filters. Uh, using the wide band filters, we can set each band to be a color channel. So, uh, we say that the G band is set to blue, the R band is set to green, and the I band is set to red. Um, and we because each image that we get out is black and white because all it is is counting how many photons hit each pixel. So there's no way to have a color image out of that. You need to combine three or more um, images to create your color image. And so you stack, once you assign which filter gets each color, you just stack them in a software uh, of your choosing. There are a lot out there. and uh, after making sure that all of your stars are properly aligned, you can get a really nice image like you see in the one that Katya made. 
Yeah, not the one that just appeared. Yes, not that one's one a little less than ideal. Uh, yeah. So I don't think we're going to get the image we really want. Uh, Katya, do you want to try going to a globular cluster? Because that's something that might I was actually, actually about to suggest. <laughs> yeah, I was about to suggest uh, M M thirteen, M five, M ninety two, M three. Take your pick. M three. <laughs> Um, is M3 up? I can check if M3 is up. Yeah. Check, see which one's at the highest. Yeah. When in doubt, globular yeah. clusters. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> globular clusters are very easy to see. Um, they're not as finicky as, as other things like nebula or nebulae or galaxies. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, amazing. I'm going. All right. And Amanda, would you please tell us exactly why globular clusters are some of the coolest things in the sky? Yes. And my please dark... talk about dark matter. Yeah, my dark matter pitch. Yeah, so globular yes. clusters are really, really cool um, for a number of reasons. It's sort of interesting because they're relatively close to us and they've been observed for so long. Like people have been looking at globular clusters for such a long time. Um, but even now they're still at the cutting edge of research because what people have started realizing is that globular clusters are distributed differently than our, uh, than our Milky Way. So our Milky Way is sort of flat, it's a spiral galaxy and globular clusters are distributed like kind of spherically around our, uh, around our galaxy. And we think it's because they're tracing something called the dark matter halo of our galaxy, uh, which is really cool. Um, and just means that they're, tra they're basically tracing the dark matter in the galaxy. Um, and we're trying to understand, uh, so we can understand a lot about how dark matter, where dark matter is and how it sort of forms in relation to how luminous matter forms. Uh, in galaxies and how those two would interact. Um, so globular clusters are really cool because we can use them to potentially trace dark matter. Um, they're also really cool because nobody really understands globular clusters at all, how they formed, uh, why they formed. So there's a lot of open research questions, globular clusters, even though they're so close and have been studied for so long. Yeah. Um, it's also like there are a lot of researchers that are looking at globular clusters in other galaxies uh, because you can see the whole galaxy, whereas in the Milky Way, you can't see our whole galaxy because we're in it, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's really hard to detect globular clusters in other galaxies. It's a whole, like, it's a whole, you know, bustling field of research. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Because like, are they, how resolved are they in, in a different galaxy? Oh, Selma could not pinpoint. Oh. Oh. Try imaging. Anyway. Yeah, big image. And I, I did bring up another uh, object. This is M82. So one thing we were talking about before was how objects, you know, have a three-dimensional shape despite us looking at kind of a two-dimensional image. And so when we looked at the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy, we're looking at the straight on at the face, which is why it's beautiful and large, and you can see all of the detail in the arms and everything like that. But sometimes in space, all, not all the galaxies are oriented in the same direction uh, relative to us. And so some of those spiral galaxies are on their side, and we look into them from the edge, so kind of view them edge on. Uh, typically, they have, get all sorts of names. Uh, this is the Cigar Galaxy. There's another one called the Surfboard Galaxy. Uh, there's, I mean, think of something that's kind of uh, that cigar shape. There's probably a galaxy nicknamed with that object. And typically, you can actually see if there's uh, star formation in there because they'll have kind of these little dust lanes where there's more material. You can actually see that going on in this spiral galaxy. And that's one of the reasons we know it's a spiral galaxy is because spiral galaxies are the ones that typically have more form star formation. 
How did our image? Oof. Something is up. I think. Guy. I think it's just when it takes the image. You can see the ten second exposure is so bad that astrometry just won't work. Is so this the problem up here? Sorry. Could this be it up here? Could this be what? Hmm. Could that be the cluster? No, I guess it'd be probably be a little bigger than that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you would see it. Oh yeah, uh, it was in this one too. That spot. Yeah. Yeah, it's so because astrometry is being performed, this image is relatively poor. So astrometry.net is having a hard time to find you know the star patterns to figure out where you are um, right I, that's the reason that it's not the tracking that's the problem it's the astrometry well uh this is another part of loving astronomy is you are just susceptible to whatever mother nature throws at you and sometimes it does not allow us to take good images so i think Unfortunately, we're going to have to call it a night. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Please feel free to please share this with people you want. Uh, maybe also share some of our older shows for better observing sessions um, mm -hmm. when we actually had some clear skies. And make sure to join us next week as we will have Diana Coleman, who is the president of the Yerkes Future Foundation. She will be on the show with us at 8 p.m. And Kanti and I will get to talk to her about all things Yerkes. So uh, feel free to join us next week and enjoy the rest of your night. And thank you for staying up with us. Yep. Thank you, guys. If you have any comments or suggestions or things you want to see or topics you want us to talk about, let us know. Thank you for joining us for this as well, Amanda. Bye. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Here we go.